lines came about when Sammy was 13. She called me up when I was on a book tour for one of my grown-up books, and she said, I think I have a really good idea for a novel. And I said, all right, let's hear it. And she said, well, what if every time that you close the pages of a book, the characters inside it had lives and personalities completely different from the roles that they played when they were inside the book? Yet every time a reader opened it again, they would have to jump right back into performing Act 1, Scene 1 all over again. And what if there was a prince in a fairy tale who was really sick of being a prince in a fairy tale, but couldn't figure out how to make anyone see him as anything other than that prince? Until there was a girl on the outside, a teenager, who was kind of a loner and liked to read, and she was obsessed with a kid's fairy tale because the prince who was illustrated inside it was drawn in a very attractive way. And one day she realized that he was speaking directly to her and wanted her help getting out of the book. So you know what it's like to root for a character, to wish that he might show up in the grocery store, to um, imagine what these lives would be like after that last page is turned. And that's really what Between the Lines is about. It invites you to think of what would happen if fiction wasn't really so fictional. So what I'm going to do now is read to you from one of the narrative voices in the book. I get to be Prince Oliver. I don't know. But, and um, Sammy is going to be Delilah. She is the girl on the outside who's reading it. So this is Oliver. Just so you know, when they say once upon a time, they are lying. It's not once upon a time. It's not even twice upon a time. It's hundreds of times, over and over, every time someone opens the pages of this dusty old book. I'm weird. Everyone says so. I suppose it's because while other 15-year-olds are talking about the best lip gloss and which movie star is hotter, I would rather be curled up with a book. Seriously, have you been to a high school lately? Why would anyone sane want to interact with Cro-Magnon hockey players or run a gauntlet of mean girls? I'd much rather pretend I'm somewhere else. And any time I open the pages of a book, that happens. Did you have any arguments or disagreements when writing between the lines with your mom? <laughs> we did have a few small arguments. Um, one of them was actually over the color of Prince Oliver's hair. <laughs> if you look in the book, he has black hair, but I can tell you that in reality, he is a blonde. <laughs> um, we also argued over the fairy tale section of the book. The book is split into three narratives. There's Prince Oliver, which you heard from my mom, Delilah, who you heard from me, and the fairy tale that Prince Oliver is stuck in. And with that fairy tale, my mom wanted it to be sort of funny, tongue-in-cheek, like the movie Shrek. And I really disagreed, and I said I wanted it to be much darker, more like the Grimm Brothers tales. And I told her that I wanted it to be like that because those books are so genius in the way that the characters go through so much pain and suffering that when they get their happily ever after, it's just that much better. And she agreed to go along with it, and we kept it that way. And if you read the book, it is a darker fairy tale. Do you think this book is a sort of experimental work, and why? Yeah, it's very much an experimental work, and I'm so excited about it, because um, it is probably going to be the most beautiful book you have ever held in your hands. If you look at it, allow me to move my moving head piece. Thing <laughs> yeah. If you look at it, um, the book has four color illustrations. So for example, when you read the fairy tale sections, you will see something like this. You'll see these beautiful illustrations that Delilah would be falling in love with when she was reading the fairy tale. And um, they're four color illustrations. And then if you read the different narratives of Delilah and Oliver, you'll see they're in different fonts, in different colors. And there are these cool little silhouettes drawn throughout them as well. It's a really beautiful book to hold. Did you have the whole book plotted before you started to write, or did you just go with the flow? So when we, that very first day we went into my mom's office to write, I, we sat down and I said, Mom, I have the last line. And we typed it up, and then while we wrote the rest of the book, we worked towards that very ending line. And it felt very, it was like finishing a puzzle 
when we got to that last sentence that just connected the whole story to the last one. Do you have any advice for aspiring writers, and particularly being a young writer, what advice would you give to other young writers out there? Um, so what really helped me the most was the schedule that my mom set for us. Um, being a teenager, and it was my summer vacations that we were writing, I did get distracted a lot. <laughs> and um, so she would sit down every day and she'd tell me how many pages we were going to finish and how long we were going to work. And having a set time and um, amount that I had to get done each day really helped to move us along to get the final product of a book. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I probably would have done that thing that you usually do with essays as a teenager, where you say, I worked really hard today. I'm gonna write it tomorrow. And you just keep pushing it until it's that last night and you're like, oh crap, I forgot about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> it probably wouldn't have get, gotten really done. And that I've had ideas like that that never got finished because mm. I didn't have that drive to um, get the complete product. And that's, my mom's schedule really helped with that. That, that definitely is a big part of it. I usually tell people that um, if you want to be a writer, you should really carve time out each day to write, and it doesn't matter if it's 20 minutes. You know, Get up 20 minutes earlier, but during those 20 minutes, don't check Facebook, and don't text anyone, and don't talk to your parents. Just write. Um, I also highly recommend taking a writing course at some point, a writing workshop. It will teach you to create on demand, and to give and get criticism, and ultimately, I talked a little bit about the tools that a reader needs. A writer's best tool is to be his or her own best editor, and those are that's what a writing workshop will teach you. And um, my last bit of advice for aspiring writers right now is about self-publishing. That is becoming very um, avant-garde, and a lot of people are saying, well, I don't need to get 100 rejections from agents. I can go home now and put my story up on Kindle. And you can. And it would be a big mistake. Um, right now, there is no way to separate the wheat from the chaff in self-publishing. It's very hard for readers to know whether they're downloading something that has been slaved over for several years or something that has been written in 10 minutes. And because of that, you don't necessarily have an audience. Everybody thinks the publishing contract is the brass ring you're grabbing for. But in reality, what you want are readers. A story exists but doesn't do much unless you have people reading it. And ultimately, that is what a brick and mortar publisher does for you. They have the clout, they have the marketing departments, they have the PR departments to be able to say, Sammy has a new book out. And you should read it. And here Sammy's going to be appearing at this library and you can come and listen to her. And then you listen and then you tell a few of your friends and maybe she'll come to your book club. And what they're doing is spreading word of mouth and making sure that people know your product exists. If you are not ready to completely leave your job and be your own promoter for six months or so, don't expect anyone to be able to find your book if you self-publish it.